We have uh, another great guest from beyond the borders of Montana. Today. Yeah, some might consider it beyond the borders of America. He's from New York. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Yevgeny Feynman on the air today. <laughs> Uh, Yev is a fellow of the Manhattan Institute. We've had him on many times before. He's actually the deputy director now of the Center for Medical Progress. Um, and I got him on to talk about wow. why the insurance rates are spiking in Montana. This is something we talked about not too long ago, about yeah. three or four weeks ago when we got the numbers. Um, our local officials were kind of shocked, and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to get an expert's opinion on why they've been tilting the way they've been tilting. Um, you can read Yev's articles online. I'm going to link on our webpage uh, to the Manhattan Institute's website where you can find some of the stuff he said and also some of his television interviews with uh, people more famous than Peter and I. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah, as you can tell, Peter's been living in Montana for a long time. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Yev, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I, I actually don't think there's anyone more famous than you guys. So. Well, there you, there you go. There so. <laughs> Stroke, stroke, stroke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, now Yevgeny, I, I think I know why the, the prices have spiked. Would you like to hear my non-professional, totally amateurish opinion? Well, take a guess. All right, here we go. I, I think what happened is when they set all this up, the uh, insurance companies lowballed. The uh, federal government said, well, I, I can paint that car for nineteen ninety five, <laughs> and And then when the time came to actually deliver, they said, oops, we, uh, uh, we're going to have to raise the rates a little bit. <laughs> so am I wrong or what? Uh, you're, you're pretty much uh, on the money here. The, there's, <laughs> there, there's some other stuff going on. Um, you know, uh, but part of it, honestly, is, uh, is, is, is the fault of Republicans. I'll, I'll, I'll say that right away because... Um, what happened is we were supposed to have a certain amount of risk corridor payments. It's one of these federal backstops. And Republicans, um, at the end of uh, last year, uh, passed, passed legislation as part of the uh, budget process uh, to avoid the, uh, hitting the, the, the debt ceiling to um, require that these payments uh, be completely deficit neutral. Um, they, they were never intended to be. And the way they work in Part D, for instance, they're not required to be deficit neutral every single year. Typically, uh, they balance out over a few years. But because of that, only about a quarter of the claims from insurers are actually getting paid. So as a result, insurers are, have to push up their premiums because of that. There, there are rising health care costs, especially when you look at prescription drugs, um, at least for this one year. Um, you had a lot of new hep C drugs. Uh, there's some new cholesterol drugs that are hitting the market that are going to be very expensive. So insurers are factoring that in. Montana also, unfortunately, doesn't have much in the way of competition in its individual market. You guys only have three insurers competing. One of them is the healthcare co-op, which I don't know how long it's going to be around for, uh, to, to, to be frank. Um, no, hold on. Let me, let me jump in here. Now, why, why do you believe it's not going to be around very long? Because it's not making any money or what? Well, yeah, this, this has been a trend among, uh, among all the co-ops. Um, they're in dire financial straits. They've uh, incurred significant losses. And I, I think well, well over 10 of them have already failed nationally. Um, Out of how many total? Uh, 23 total. So more, uh, we're almost at 50% yeah. failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's climbing. Pretty much all of them are in dire financial straits. None of them are actually doing well. What, well, is Montana's in that same bucket, or are you just it, saying that Montana... It is, it is in that same bucket. It's not doing as bad as, uh, as the rest of them. So earlier this year, actually, S&P issued a report looking at, uh, at the financials of a bunch of these companies. Um, Montana's wasn't called out as one of the, one of the worst, but it's still doing much worse than the other insurers in the state, uh, Blue Cross and Pacific. Now, what is, what is the tipping point for, for a group like supposedly a nonprofit uh, co-op to say we have to throw in the towel here? It's, it's not really clear. It depends on uh, operational costs. So it depends how much you're paying your, uh, your employees. It depends what your administrative costs are. The problem that the co-ops are facing is that unlike the big insurers, they don't really have much in the way of reserves, so they don't have money uh, stashed away. And it's much harder for them to raise money because they can't, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they can't go to uh, capital markets the way that for-profit companies can. So uh, were these specially mandated through the ACA? Yes, they were. This was uh, this was the creation of the ACA as an alternative to uh, to the public option. 
So initially, the the first draft of the ACA had a government-run insurance plan um, that that wasn't going to fly. Even a lot of Democrats wouldn't support it. And as a way of getting some more people on board, they created this other option. Uh, we gave out uh, a lot of, a lot of money in loans, well over a billion dollars, to these nonprofit entities with the idea that because they're nonprofit, they don't profit, which which is a misleading statement to begin with. <laughs> Tell our mayor that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, the, the, the idea was that they, they could uh, compete a little bit, they could uh, possibly offer better care, and in the first year they did price quite a bit lower than others, but that comes at a cost, and they're facing that cost now. Well, the, the whole the whole idea, please forgive me, and now you're an economist, so you've set me straight here, but the whole idea of having a for-profit company is so that you work harder to make a profit. But when you work for a non-profit company, what is the benefit of working harder or longer hours or being more innovative or being more creative if you're not going to make any any money on the deal? Well, uh, so here, here's how it works. And when, when you're talking about making a profit, ultimately that profit belongs to shareholders. So uh, the, the incentive there is that people want to want to see your company become more more efficient. They want to see your company uh, figure out ways to keep more of its money while still providing value. So that that profit that goes to shareholders who put pressure on the company in exchange for providing equity or debt financing. Um, when you talk about nonprofits, nonprofits can innovate also because you're still paying people, you still have employees, you can offer bonuses. Um, okay, I got you. You know, nonprofit hospitals certainly pay their executives pretty well. Yeah, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I know that, that that might come as a surprise to some people. Yeah, well, well, nonprofits nonprofits around here. <laughs> look how much United Way officials get paid. Oh yeah. Anyway. For yeah. Example. So, we're up against a break, 721-1290. If you have a question for Yevgeny Feynman, this is a guy who knows the ins and outs of, of the Affordable Care Act and, and all the various uh, health plans and markets and exchanges and all that. So give us a call. If you have a question or a comment, maybe a complaint, maybe something has happened to you and you're scratching your head as to how did this go from this to this all of a sudden. Let's uh, go to the phones. Uh, we have asked for callers. By golly, we got one. Bruce, good morning. You're on Talkback. Hi. Well, good morning, guys. Um... I guess my question concerns with all this increasing cost on this bait and switch. Um, any idea what the personal mandate will do? I mean, will it be cheaper to, to forfeit the personal mandate than to get the insurance? That's the individual mandate, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, it will be, uh, and that's that's partly why uh, why the administration, I, I think, has has lowballed their estimate for. Um, for enrollment in the 2015 enrollment season, um, the, the the mandate climbs to two and a half percent of income or uh, around seven hundred dollars. But compared to premiums of let's say two three thousand dollars a year um, at at the low end, if if you're not getting subsidies, uh, coupled with you know a four or five thousand dollar deductible, that uh, individual mandate penalty is often cheaper, especially if you're not really going to go to the, to the doctor that much during the year, uh, maybe end up in the ER once. Um, often it will make economic sense to just stay uninsured. So people are going to find a way around it, right? Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people will choose to remain uninsured. Um, uh, on the other hand, employers are still offering coverage, even when we thought they'd be dropping coverage. So that's going to be a bit of a saving grace here. But you will still see a lot of people refusing to go on the exchanges. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Else, well, just please? remember, guys, it's so wonderful, you have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bruce. All right. Appreciate yeah. the call. Larry, Larry, you're on talk back with Yevgeny Feynman. Hi. Yes, good morning. Uh, the big argument in the legislature last year against the uh, state signing on to the uh, big health care plan was that, uh, you know, we've got 70,000 people out there that need to... Uh, be covered, and here's a big gap. Well, and, you, 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 you mean you mean you mean about the Medicaid expansion? Yeah, you mean right? the Medicaid yes. expansion? Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, the Republicans were making the argument. Well, yeah, maybe there are, but uh, the when the feds back out of this program, it's going to be on the state. And uh, do you foresee this happening? I hear that there are a lot of exchanges that are going broke, and the uh, I assume the federal government is propping those up. But when the federal feds uh, back out of this, uh, 
it's going to be on the state, and it could be a lot more expensive than they're projecting. And I also question the numbers. I heard there were only about 30,000 people that signed up for this program in the first place. Are you talking about here in Montana? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Larry. Yes. We appreciate the call. So uh, any comment on that, Yevgeny? Um, you know, when, when it comes to Medicaid, uh, it's, it's going to be tough for a future administration to really um, – go back on 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 the funding pro- promise so at, at the end of the day this is the expansion population um, the feds are supposed to uh, are supposed to pick up about ninety uh, percent of that the states are going to be responsible for ten percent now when all is said and done um, you know the, the, there's a precedent i guess that's that's been set by the current administration in particular uh... that allows them to uh... you know for lack of a better word flout the laws and uh, operate with a lot of discretion. So, if future administration decides to take that precedent, you know, maybe they could uh, renege on some of that funding. But I, I can bet that if they started doing that, states would sue them, and it, it would be hard to see um, the Supreme Court supporting the administration in that kind of case. Um, that being said, I think uh, one one of the things Republicans have to focus on is how to close that gap. If they don't want to do Medicaid expansion. They need a solid plan for closing that gap in every single state because there are some states where that gap is pretty significant. Those tend to be red states. And honestly, no real Republican uh, insurance reform plan is going to succeed without closing that gap. Now, may I ask you a question? And and this is something that I've been thinking about for the last five years, really, since the, the Affordable Care Act became law. All right. Uh, every every year and every time someone's running for, for office, they say, we're going to repeal Obamacare. We're going to roll that. Th-. Well, let me ask you this. With with the fact that it is it has roots so deep now in our society, in our business world, is it even possible to repeal the Affordable Care Act? Well, I, I think outright repeal is uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a fantasy at this point. Um, Frankly, uh, if, if you have roughly 10 million people on the exchanges, uh, if you want to go to, to 10 million people and, uh, you know, however many people are in Medicaid, uh, that's at least another, uh, another 7 or 8 million that, that, that have benefited from the expansion. If you want to go to those people and say, um, you know, we're going to kick you off your insurance, that takes a lot of political capital. And I don't think Republicans have that. I don't think they're going to be willing. I don't think they're able to do that. So they um, missed their chance. Absolutely. Yeah. All well, right. Let me ask you this. I wanted to pose it this way because I think we're going to hear about it in the next election cycle in this way. You know, basically, that uh, the Affordable Care Act has worked. Uh, it's been quite a bit of a success. 11 million people that weren't insured are now insured. We've dropped the uninsured rate from something like 18 million to like 13 million. Is that something that um, is... Uh, can you respond to that? Um, you know, the, the, there's something to be said for uh, for for cutting the, uh, the the uninsured rate, and frankly, in 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 that regard, the uh, the ACA has worked. Uh, the uninsured rate right now is the lowest that it's ever been since we've started recording the uninsured rate, um, and that that's a huge success. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the the exchanges are pretty much unattractive for the middle class. Uh, if you look at enrollment by uh, by income levels, um, after about 200% of the federal poverty line, enrollment plummets because the premiums are so high and subsidies are relatively scant. Um, I, I think acknowledging uh, where the ACA succeeded is important if we want to go forward and still make changes because you can only continue parroting political talking points for so long. Right. Okay, let's get some more calls. Uh, and this will be Mike. Mike, you're on with Evgeny Feynman. Hi. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, after Democrats in the House and Senate um, sent the congressional rules and rushed the legislation through in the dead of night, um, uh, Republicans had uh, Republicans had um, political advantage. They used that as an excuse to uh, run on the issue on the next election cycle. They gained seats. I think they gained. Uh, I think they gained the House in the next election cycle. I, I'm just wondering if this is a cynical ploy by Republicans um, to keep the issue going but not fix it. It's kind of a political. It's kind of a, a political windfall for them if they can keep Obamacare limping along and staggering and uh, not very successful, but not fix the problem. Then they have a campaign issue almost every cycle. It's. Um, 
Okay. I, I tell you what, Mike. I, I, wish they, I wish they would get off their dust and just, just fix it. <laughs> right. Either. You know, I, I, I think there, there, there's a part of me, a really, really cynical skeptic, that secretly thinks that's the case. Um, realistically, I, I don't think so. I think... Um, Republicans partly have uh, have their hands tied uh, because their initial opposition to the ACA is hard to reverse um, and really and still look good doing it. Um, but I do think Republicans uh, ultimately do care about good policy. They care about what happens with uh, with the health care system. Um, Democrats have made it difficult to propose uh, different alternatives, especially with the administration the way it is. Um, I think. After this election cycle, we'll see uh, much more serious uh, reform plans start coming out. Okay. What, what, what would that look like? I mean, just give us an idea of a fix that you think should be touted in the election cycle. So, number one, uh, and uh, the nice thing about this is you get some political points uh, w- uh, against the Democrats, uh, replace the Cadillac tax with a cap on the value of employer-sponsored coverage. Um, it reduces uh, the burden of the tax. It makes it a little easier to handle, but you still keep uh, the, the effect on, on health care spending. You're still reducing health care spending by doing that. Um, it's, it's nice and populist. It appeals to unions. It appeals to business. Um, it's a really simple fix. Beyond that, I mean, expanding rating bans uh, for insurance plans on the exchanges. That's been a popular uh, popular fix that's been touted. Small things like that. It's about incrementalist changes. Okay, let's hurry up and get another call in. Alan, got about a minute and a half. Go ahead. Yeah, it seems to me that what is going on here is a real definite separation between health care and health insurance. Because what's happened is the cost of the deduction deductible on our health insurance has become so high that people actually aren't using it and therefore they're not getting health care. So what we have done with the Affordable Health Care Act is we have made insurance available and reduced the amount of health care that people can get. So, all right, thanks for the call. What, what do you think about that uh, portrayal? You know, there, there's some truth to that. Um, certainly, health insurance isn't health care, uh, and I think we have to keep that in mind as we as we talk about uh, health care reform. Um, it's it's somewhat true that, that there are people who aren't using health care because they're deductibles, they're avoiding certain procedures. Um, partly, you do want to see that. Uh, what, one, one of the reasons you have health insurance is to protect against catastrophic risk. You don't want it to protect against ordinary risk, ordinary uh, or ordinary procedures that you may or may not necessarily need. So if people are avoiding unnecessary care or only mildly necessary care, that might be a good thing. Now, we, we still have seen utilization increase. Um, spending on health care is still growing, and it's, it's increasing at a growing rate. Part of that comes from Medicaid expansion, but part of that is also coming out of people uh, using their, uh, their Obamacare insurance plan. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Now, so some, some have said, because of what Alan mentioned, that it's almost impossible to afford the deductible, uh, that people are going even more to the emergency rooms than they did before. Uh, it's it's true. Um, a lot of what people are going to the emergency rooms for uh, is necessary care. Um, we we saw a huge uptick in yeah. use of the emergency room for uh, emergent conditions, but people do also go for ordinary care. We saw an increase there too. Evgeny, we were completely out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll look for you more on the Manhattan Institute uh, webpage. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. So that's going to do it for this half hour.